Now, while the new Prey reboot is drastically different from the originally planned sequel, I'm still interested in seeing where this new direction for the series takes us. I mean, Dishonored wasn't bad, and the reboot's being done by the same team, but will it be good as the original? Well, only time will tell. Yeah, you probably saw this one coming. After reviewing and playing the original, it would only make sense that I would see how the reboot fares next. Despite a couple of red flags popping up, which I'll get into later, I went in kind of excited as I saw that just the demo alone was garnering praise from practically everyone under the sun. Even a friend of mine really liked it, which further drew me in to take a look at it. So, will it impress? Is it worthy of the hype? I guess we'll find out. So the story takes place in an alternate future where President JFK lived after the assassination attempt at Dealey Plaza. Having survived the attempt, this makes him even more motivated to shove more funding into the space program as a whole. So much progress had already been made that it eventually attracted a hostile alien race known as the Typhon. Years later in the future, and you take control of Morgan Yu, who has just recently been recruited to join the staff at the Talos 1 space station. However, before he can join them, Alex, his brother, beckons him to participate in a test for their new neuromods. After the test goes wrong when a Typhon breaks containment, Morgan is sedated and brought back to his apartment, seemingly living the day over again. All of this is cut short, however, as he discovers a dead body and a mysterious ally named January, who suggests that he leaves his apartment, and not in the way that you might think. Yep, everything you knew was a lie. You've been aboard the Talos one for three years, and it's now going to shit with the Typhon wreaking havoc on everyone and everything in sight. Now this, I feel, was a very well done twist, and honestly, this was the driving point for me to buy and try out the rest of the game. However, I found out very quickly that the game's main story immediately drops in quality shortly after that sequence. And I'll also go into that later, but first we're going to talk about what Prey does right. Number 1. Optimization and Graphics So, after Dishonored 2 had a horrible launch and severe optimization issues, it seems like Arcane were adamant about making up for it, which I can safely say that they did. I only had it crash on me once and a bit of stuttering that went away once I restarted the game. But other than that, it ran great. When I heard initially that the game was going to use CryEngine 5, I was a bit skeptical, with Homefront 2 being a good example as to how unoptimized it can be if left unchecked. Thankfully, my worries were shattered, as it runs and looks really good, as weapons and character models, and even the environment around you is lovingly detailed with some crisp-ass textures. Talos 1 itself is very big and expansive, both inside and out. The scale of it all is really impressive, and the lighting and the shadows are also really well done and add a whole lot to the overall atmosphere. 2. The Music Fresh off the flaming heels of Doom, continually rising superstar Mick Gordon returns once more to compose the soundtrack to Prey. And while it's not as memorable in comparison to his previous works, that doesn't mean it's bad. Far from it. I have a bad feeling, though, that people will gloss over Mick's work here because it's not like Doom. It's a lot more of a subdued experience. You still have your tense, glitchy electronic stuff when things get going, but there's also a couple songs that blend in some more traditional instruments along with the electro stuff, which is cool. Oh, and there's also a synthwave song that he made, which is lit as fuck. And the song that you're hearing now plays whenever you're floating in space outside of Talos 1, and to me it's easily one of the best off of the whole track list. Other than that, I feel like the soundtrack, while again, not as memorable in comparison, still holds its own and still reflects the overall atmosphere of isolation and the retro-futuristic aesthetic of Talos 1 itself. It did it again, Mick. Love ya. Number 3. The Gameplay while the gameplay has some flaws and some other parts, it's one of my more favorite aspects of the game, as you would hope. Aside from using the wrench, which is mostly useless, combat is fun and so are the weapons that you use. Granted, the selection could have been larger. You have a shotgun that occasionally knocks over certain Typhons you fight. There's a silenced pistol that for some reason does a bunch of damage. The glue gun, which allows you to freeze most Typhon in place so that you can shoot them a bunch or smack them with the wrench and the Q-Beam, a laser gun that causes whatever it hits to implode at a certain point. Then there are Neuromods. These act as your skill points, and they grant anything from health and suit upgrades, being able to hack into robots and turrets, and eventually, using the same powers as the Typhon. 
For example, with a combination of research with the Psychoscope and Neuromods, you can lay fire and electric traps and little pads of energy that lift you or anything else upwards, so that way you can try and counter whatever else the Typhon throw at you. Although it never really felt like I was any more powerful than before, the powers did help once in a while, because some can counter and temporarily disable the powers of the Typhon and hostile robots, depending on their weaknesses. You can also finesse your way through locked areas or blocked passages by shape-shifting into an object, much like the Mimics do, which is occasionally useful and kind of funny. Speaking of which, the one thing that I do appreciate, though, is the freedom of choice when it comes to navigation. There's the Mimic powers, which I just mentioned, as well as the Glue Gun, which is easily your greatest ally and the best tool in your arsenal by far. You can shoot the gun at walls and climb up on the stuff that sticks to them to help you reach places that you wouldn't normally be able to reach. With this gun, you can legally cheese the game and solve problems your way, and it's glorious. And the final good bit I'd say about the gameplay is being out in space, floating around Talos 1. There's just something about how it controls, looks, and again, the overall scale and detail that went into Talos 1, it's just impressive to me. So with all that said and done, now we get into the things that Prey does not as well. You're not gonna like what I have to say next. First off, I know it's obvious, but this game barely has an original bone in its body, like whatsoever. Arcane even said that Prey takes after System Shock as a successor, as an inspiration. But see, that's not the only stuff that they studied from. Which, now if you don't mind, I'd like to showcase Prey's other inspirations that the game clearly takes elements from. Now, emulating your peers is fine, don't get me wrong, but my point is there's a lot of things that they took and barely changed, nor tried doing differently, even directly porting mechanics from Dishonored. Moving off of that, I also mentioned that the gameplay was both good and bad in certain places, and I'll now elaborate as to why. I think I should start with the Typhon, considering I barely mentioned them thus far. The variations of the Typhon are varied, but also not so varied. It's kind of hard to explain. See, you have at least five or six Typhon with an elemental or a psychic variation. You have the Mimic, who shapeshifts into whatever is around it to catch you off guard. The Phantom, who teleports back and forth and shoots energy balls. The Poltergeist, which turns invisible and throws shit at you. The Telepath, which can shoot homing energy balls and control the minds of humans, using them as suicide bombers. The Weaver, which spawns little exploding balls that roll towards you. And finally, the Nightmare, which is pretty much an overglorified Phantom. Oh, and you also have to fight against robots corrupted by the Typhon, too. So we have a reasonable yet still kind of small cast of enemies, and sometimes the variations that they have cause way more issues in less of an actual challenging sort of way, and more of like an artificial difficulty sort of way. Perfect example, the Telepath. Now, as mentioned not even a minute ago, its powers are annoying, but there's more. The only variant of this Typhon, the Technopath, is able to hack robots and grab turrets with telekinesis, and use them against you if any just so happen to be lying around. So that's even more annoying. Where the artificial difficulty comes in is, if you're like how I was and you put all your neuromod points into health and suit upgrades, and you didn't know that you didn't get the psychoscope until after three to four hours in, there's a big chance that you won't have what you need in order to defeat them. And you will come across these types of enemies pretty early on. So since we're talking about both here, the game has an EMP grenade for robots and the telepath, and the null wave grenade with an anti-psychic effect for the telepath here, for example. Since they're flying creatures, they're not going to be that effective. But it'll be all you got until you get more neuromods. But even then, the grenades are hard to find, and at this point, you still need to find a blueprint in order to just craft them. It's all just really frustrating. Oh, and speaking about crafting... 
The way you gain resources and prey is another major contributor to how long and how tedious the game can be at times. There's no merchant or store or anything like that, no. You find whatever you need by scavenging and exploring for the items themselves, or by scavenging and exploring for junk, which then you can put said junk in a recycling machine, and through that machine you get back resource cubes for crafting. Then with these you go back to a fabricator machine and craft what you need from there. But even then, let's say you want shotgun shells, for example. The junk that you need to create the ammo for your shotgun requires three different types of materials in different quantities each, in which specific junk that will give you the correct materials is just as rare to come across enough of as much as the godforsaken ammo itself is. Not to mention, when you're fighting aliens that have loads of health and deal a lot of damage, more often than not, you'll soon run out of ammo or health again. And once more, you'll have to stop what you're doing to go and search for the shit that you need, or junk to craft the shit that you need, except wait, you can barely carry any more fucking junk because the materials take up as much inventory space as a regular piece of junk, so then you need to move some things around or drop some shit, backtrack to a previous location so that you can use the stupid machines to craft the shit that you need, so that you can finally be prepared for the next fight and essentially repeat the process over again. In all honesty, it's boring as fuck. That's what it is. And for a game where the story is primarily told through its lore, you're gonna end up ignoring or straight up forgetting about the extra audio logs and terminal logs like I did, because at this point, you're worrying more about surviving another potential fight with a Typhon, and focusing more on finding resources instead of looking for clues about the world around you. And it's not like I want to hate the gameplay either, because, as I said, the other aspects are much more fun. The weapons and abilities are very enjoyable to use, and I like being able to solve my problems my way instead of there being only one set solution. However, what's not fun is the stop and start shit, constantly delaying me from continuing on with the fucking game. There's resource management, and then there's this. I can see where Arcane was coming from, as this is a unique concept, and in a way, I think they saw it as a means for people to actually go out and explore the levels a lot more. But this isn't encouraging me to explore, this feels more like it's virtually forcing me to explore. Because I can't craft anything with the piss poor amount of actual resources or the junk that I find. What I think would have worked is if they had honestly just implemented a merchant system. That way, for the people who have the money for it, they can get what they want, yet you also have the recycling and fabrication machines as a free, yet slightly more time-consuming backup plan. The two machines shouldn't have been the end-all be-all authority on how you primarily got your items, as it artificially extends the length of the game, and unintentionally forces you to ignore the most important part of the fucking story. Now here's the other fun part, the story. So, obviously some spoilers are going to be abound, so if you care, click here to skip, you get the idea. Aside from the beginning of the game and the ending, the actual main story is pretty cut and dry and kind of boring. There's also a huge lack of character development, mostly between Morgan and his brother Alex. He only talks to us a few times throughout the game, and while we do learn a few things here or there... It still doesn't make me feel like I bonded or have any sort of connection to this character whatsoever. I can excuse the fact that the side characters have little backstory aside from completing their side quests and finding audio logs. That's how the game's been so far, you gotta work a little bit for your extra story. I can accept that. That being said, Alex is a main character, and even after completing the main story, I still have little feelings for the character and even less of an idea of what his true motives were throughout the campaign and not in the way that would make him seem complex. I'm not sure if it's just because of the choices I made, or if it was like that from the very beginning. Because the audio logs I found make him sound like a huge manipulative asshole, and everybody on Talos 1 constantly talks about how they hate him, yet the game also tries to make you feel sorry for him, I guess? Even the side quests have some quick yet better stories to tell. One great example is a side quest that is derived from a main quest. See, there's a door with a voice lock you gotta open, and it's connected to the specific person named Danielle. So you have to look around the environment for audio logs and splice it together to open the door. However, through sublogs you figure out that Danielle is in a lesbian relationship with another crew member, and that her partner had been kidnapped and killed by a prisoner aboard Talos 1 who escaped and stole the identity of a cook on the ship. And through the notes and logs, you're given a hint to find Danielle, and if you find her, she helps you pass the door so you can continue onward with the story and eventually catch the killer. And over time, as you try and find the killer throughout the ship, 
He talks to you every now and again, and has these vague speeches about revenge and how he's had beef with you and your family for years. Only downside is, this side quest ends with about as much intensity as a wet fart. Morgan, you... <coughs> this part will work, but... We are over now. Regardless of the way that it ended, seeing and playing through the side quest made things a lot more obvious that all the focus for the writing went into setting up the game's world and establishing lore rather than its main story. And not everyone will like that, I know. Even I, as much as I appreciate lore and background stories, I also think that the extra story should be just as exciting and intriguing as the main story. But here, in terms of quality, the lore is certainly the more well-written out of the two, which is kind of depressing when you think about it. It just shows how expansive and interesting the stories of the station and what go on inside the station are, compared to the story of an amnesiac who can turn into a cup. So, the ending of Prey, I feel, showcases how inconsistent the writing was, as the ending isn't that great, but at the same time it's also kind of smart in a way, and I'll get to that. So, in the end, it's revealed that what you just played didn't exist. Morgan, you, and the people you've helped have been dead for years, and the Earth has already been invaded and royally fucked over by the Typhon species. Oh, and also, you were a Typhon the entire time, and the whole point of the game was in fact an experiment set up by Alex to teach you about human empathy. If you didn't do any of the important side quests or save anyone, you die. If you did, however, Alex gives you the chance to join him. And I could be overthinking things, but hypothetically, if you really think about it, the ending explains the lack of character development between you and Alex, why you never spoke, why we had such a lack of connection or compassion towards anyone, really because it was a simulation and we're an alien learning about showing compassion. Now, don't get me wrong, that doesn't excuse the fact that there was little to no character development or connection with these characters, but I figured that it's a clever enough way to disguise the lack of consistent writing. But then again, this could be just me overthinking things. So that's it. Probably the longest review I've done thus far. Closing thoughts, I was disappointed with Prey. Despite the beautiful graphics, the good combat and weapons, great world building, and a very strong opening hour, the game still ran out of steam a lot quicker than I had hoped, and its true problems became a lot more noticeable the more I played it. And in a way, I really struggled to compare it to the original in some way, but the truth of the matter is, that's impossible. We got two different beasts here, and both are interesting yet flawed for very different reasons. In the case of the original Prey, it was a simplistic old-school FPS that had been in purgatory, constantly changing hands and constantly changing direction until it eventually clawed its way out, granted not completely unscathed. Meanwhile, the new Prey tried to be as drastically different as it possibly could have been. It tried to juggle new mechanics, RPG elements, complicated mind-bending writing for the main story, and taking one too many elements from its peers that it eventually became too much to handle for him. From what I can tell, it just seems like too much multitasking and a lack of an original direction, which I know that you can't absolutely nail every aspect of a game, but I feel like some of these issues could have been reworked just fine, granted it would have taken longer. As a reboot, we could have gotten something way worse than we did, but for all of its flaws, there are simply some things I can't ignore. So would I recommend the Prey reboot? Honestly, it depends. The game has a lot of flaws, yes, but it's not as bad as I might make it seem, I assure you. That being said, it's also not a game for everyone. If you're into long games with less focus on the main story and more on world building and lore, occasional artificial difficulty, constant resource collecting and management, or even if you just want to replay the game to see what you missed, then by all means, try it. But wait for the price to drop a little bit and then see what you think. If I had to rate it, I'd have to give it a 6 out of 10. Despite the score and just because I personally can't recommend it doesn't mean it's the worst thing ever. Far from it. It's just not that good. In my opinion, it's got some ways to go before it can be the accessible masterpiece that its multiple inspirations were before it.